What's up, America? I want to tell you a little story about the path that I've been on. And hopefully this will help you if you're having tough times, if you're going through it, if you're in a bad situation, because I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to have absolutely no money whatsoever. And I know what it's like to want more for yourself. And that's what this story is about because I went through many economic changes because typically the economic social, the social economic class that I was destined to be was to be lower middle class. And that's what I was pretty much steeped into for the longest of times before, because I'm gonna tell you a few things that you need to understand and that you need to change to make your life better that you don't know what you don't know. Like, I, interesting fact, in a few videos, I, I mentioned that when you go through a long-term layoff, this impacts your income for decades. And people are, you know, because people keep rewinding that. It's like, what did he just say? I can tell in the analytics, because people are just like, what? And this is one of the things that you don't know because you've been set on this path with no instructions. You know, some of you had really good parents that schooled you, that educated you, and some of you just had put it, shiftless parents who didn't really do anything for you except gave you life and raised you and fed you, and that was about it. And this unknowing, you, you have no clue to how powerful you are. You have no clue because you've been indoctrinated into the behavior of your social economic class. There is someone out there right now who is a janitor who has the mental acuity to become a doctor. But because of the indoctrination and the social, in the social reinforcements of the social class, because this is one of the things that used to happen to me as a kid. I grew up and I have, I have a speech impediment. I know many people think that I'm lying, but I spent six years in special ed. And one of the things that happened with my social economic class is I used to leave from the first to the sixth grade, I used to go out to these vocational trailers and I would flip flashcards because I had problems saying words with TH. And there was a lot of words I just could not say. It was a problem for me. There was just something in my brain that did not allow my mental and my mouth to connect. So I spent six years in special ed and one of the conditions because of my condition, I wasn't allowed to use slang because it was hard enough for me just to speak normal and they didn't want to confuse me. So I had a very peculiar way of speaking as a child. And members of my same social economic class would like say, why are you trying to speak white? Why, why don't you speak like us? I mean, this was a problem and this is the social reinforcement of your social economic class that they will come into you and they will they will prey upon you because you're becoming dissimilar from them and they see that as an attack on who they are and their way of life so it could be sometimes very rigorous very vigorous there are millions of kids across the united states who are bullied who are beat up who are just for being different they've done nothing other than being different and i was like why do you find fault with the way that i speak percy and he just looked at me, he said, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I don't know why you speak like that. So this was my first experience with being viewed as an outsider in my social economic class. And this is going to be real important because I'm, I'm going to flash forward many, many years because I was, that's where it all started. And then I graduated high school and I joined the military and then I bumped up my social economic class and I got exposed to so many new people. I remember the first time I had a birthday party was when I was in the military. I remember um, it, was at, it was at Schofield Barracks and it was at Tripler because Tripler had hospital installations on the post and I, by good fortune I got 
alerted where I got to go work in the Tripler Hospital. I got to work in the lab. I got to wear whites and everything. It was a training program. It was really cool. And, you know, we we're just talking and I met all of these wonderful people. And then, you know, it was like, hey, you know, when's your birthday? And I was just, you know, we were talking about this. And this was many, many months in, in advance. And then one day, everyone like disappears in the lab and I go looking for them and everyone's in the break, break room and there's this big old birthday cake for me and birthday cards and gifts and stuff. And this was the first time that has ever happened to me. And I will go back to when I was in basic training, First Sergeant Branch left an indelible impression on me because he was real. And when I was going through basic training, it was the summertime, so there was a lot of reservists going through it. So, you know, he had a special place in his heart for active duty, and that was active duty. And I remember when we were getting our class A's, and he said, this is the first suit that many of you have ever had. And it kind of hit me, because it wasn't the first suit that I ever had, but some of the people I was talking to, it was. And, you know, the, the being in the military, it forces you around many people that you're not normally around. And this opens up your eyes to the way the world is. So I remember that, and I remember, and I, 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 I almost got a little teared up because this was the first time, because I didn't know these people. I didn't really know these people, but this was something that happened routinely to me because First Sergeant Branch took a liking to me and I, wherever I went, people just liked me and they did things for me. It was really interesting because when I compare and contrast that to the behavior and the treatment I got from people in my members of my homeschool, hometown, social economic class. And I'm gonna tell you what happened after I went to basic training and I went back home. Basic training was done during the summer and I lost 25 pounds. When I went home, people didn't recognize me. It was one of the strangest things because the, just the simple transformation of losing 25 pounds made it where people like, Cameron, that's you? Oh my, you've changed. I mean, it was such a radical departure from what I left because I was a chunky little monkey when I left. And you know, one of the things I did in basic training is we did PT, but we also had weights. And I would work out with the weights whenever I was good. So I really filled out nicely. And as you know, I, this new me from the high school me went up there to Hawaii. And I mean, it was the craziest thing for me because when I went, left basic training and went to Fort Sam Houston, where my MOS was, 92 Bravo, I started to get the attention of a lot of girls and that was not my norm. It wasn't, I was just sitting there like, there was this one girl who was from the west end of Birmingham, her name was Christy, and she had these beautiful green eyes and she was so cute, she had this sweet little voice and she just took a liking to me and this was like literally blowing my mind. But see, once I changed my physical, it also changed my mental. So, I, you know, Fort Sam Houston, a lot of good things happened there. I have many good memories. Then I went to Hawaii, and then I went to Schofield, and then I worked at Tripler. And then the problems began when I came to Atlanta, and I was at Fort McPherson, the place that Tyler Perry owns. And it was so different because I came from the 25th Infantry Division and people were like in awe that that's like, oh, he's from, he's from the Infantry Division. Because in the military, if you're an infantry, that's like the highest status you can have being an infantryman. And if you're affiliated with an infantry post. And I come to Fort McPherson and it was so different because, you know, Schofield Barracks, you know, we were up at 4.30 in the morning running up to Coley Coley Pass singing Cadence. And it's like six miles up there and back. And I went to this completely, I mean, Fort McPherson back in the day was so relaxed. There was no organized PD. Essentially, you had a job, you went home, and you had weekends off. Except I worked in the lab and I had to work some weekends because we had reservists who would come and sometimes we'd have to be there on site to give them, open up stuff for them and everything. And then, I was at a, a, a quandary because 
I was about six years in and I was like, you know, 14 more years, you can get retirement. Like at that point, I just decided to get out. And this is where the problems began because I got out in 1991 and I was homeless in 1997. So literally six years, because I got out, I was able to get a job. Uh, I got married, we had a family and I did all of this other stuff and it became a struggle. And I didn't understand, because you know, this was my program, and it's like you go out, you get a job, you support your family, you work, you pay bills, you go to the grocery store. And what started to happen is once I left the shelter of the military, my financial orbit began to decay. And it was little, and in the beginning, it was just a little bit, because you know, when I got out, I had terminal leave, and I had a whole bunch of you know, I literally had three months of terminal leave, so I was getting my full military check, even though I wasn't doing anything. And then I got a job, like, pretty much my second week out of the military. So I was getting my job income and I was getting my military income. So I wasn't really feeling financial pressure. But once that terminal leave started and I began to have adult bills and, you know, I still had a car payment and I, you know, I had a rent and, it slowly started to decay and I could feel it because I didn't have as much money as I used to have. And what I didn't realize was that was the beginning of me entering into poverty. That was the beginning because, you know, I was working, I was bringing home money, but I was never making any financial headway. And this is why it was so easy for me to be homeless. And many of you are in the same situation where you're working, you, you do everything you can, and at the end of the month, there's just not enough money. And I kept finding myself in this situation that I got a part-time job, then I got a PRN job. I, there was a two-year period that I worked seven days a week, didn't miss a day, seven days a week. And I was proud of that, but I didn't understand the things I'm gonna tell you later in this video. And, you know, 91 was okay, 92, it got kind of hard, 93, 94, 95, 97. And 97 is when it hit the fan because I was married at the time and I came home because I worked second shift at Northside Hospital and my ex-wife was in a bad mood. And we got into a fight. And then she's like, I'm gonna call the police on you. And me being a smart ass, I hand her the phone because I didn't do nothing to this chick. And she called 911 and the police came and this was during the Rodney King era and my heart was all up in my chest and at the time I was working out, I was diesel. And the cops came and they separated us and they walked around because one cop was orbiting the apartment, he was walking around because I didn't touch her, I didn't shove her, I didn't do anything. She just blatantly lied. And this started, this set a chain of events off that were crazy because she left with the kids and what she did is lie to her family and my family that I had abused her. And they believed her and everyone started treating me differently. And it was the craziest thing. I didn't understand what had happened until many, many years later. And it was like, I was this abuser, except I wasn't. I never touched her. And this began the, and she also told some of our shared friends and they, they distanced themselves from me based on her words. No evidence, no jury, none, just boom. Okay, he did that. He's a bad dude. We're going to not participate. We're not going to be around him. And one of the funniest things is through that period, my network got fractured because of that lie. And then I fell into a state of depression. I mean, you know, when th things like this happen, you, you don't expect your wife to call the police on you and say you hit her when you didn't. You, you never wake up thinking that's gonna happen, but it did happen. And slowly but surely, I, I started, my work performance fell off, and this was the descent, the descent into poverty because that one chain of events, that one lie, that one event just started all of this mess. And literally, eight months later, I found myself homeless. Eight months, just eight months, because my work performance deteriorated, and then she took the car that we had, which I was still paying for, and then I figured out a way to get another car. But 
it was because I still had to pay bills because I still had to pay her child support. And that was another hit already on my meager income. Well, it was pretty decent income back for, you know, for where I was. But that happened and this happened. And the next thing I know, I was homeless, like literally eight months after that event happened. And let me just tell you, being homeless, you get really creative because I was homeless during the summer. And one of the things I did is like I had a gym membership. And what I would do is take my showers at the gym and I would sleep in the parking deck at Northside Hospital. And I'll tell you a little crazy little story. My car battery went dead. Something will happen with my battery. Fortunately for me, it was a five speed. So what I would do is I would park in the parking garage at a certain level near one of the ramps and I would jump start it and I would roll out and put it in second gear and jump start my car. And that's how I got around for about three or four months. These are the things that you, you do when you're poor because it's all about surviving. It, it, it's, it's, it's about you know, making it to the next day. And this becomes a habit of surviving. There, the urge to thrive and to rise up, that's not even your mindset. Your whole mindset is, it's Monday, let me make it to Tuesday. God, let me make it to Wednesday. God, let me make it to Thursday. God, make it. That's your, that's the, this is the negative loop that you enter into when you enter into the descent of poverty. You never ever think of appreciation. You never think of building. You never think of abundance. It's, it becomes a habit. It becomes such a pernicious habit. And I fell into that habit where I was doing crazy things. And then uh, actually due to my emotional state, I was emotionally unregulated. I actually slugged an employee at work. And fortunately for me, the employee did not rat me out, even though she would have, yeah, she would have been well intentioned because this is how it happened. I was so stressed out because, you know, I had this child support, uh, I had this car issue, I was homeless, and she just came up behind me and she was just playing around and I just reacted all inappropriately. You know, one of the things, I apologized profusely because that wasn't me, but these certain elements of stress, lack of money, and scarcity will formate you and formulate you into such a person that you will not be the person you were before this happened. And I didn't understand this until years and years later after I got therapy that I had transitioned into another person. And this is what happens when you become poor because one of the most expensive things in America is to be poor because every choice has an emotional toll of a cost. Am I gonna pay the electric bill? Am I not gonna pay the electric bill? Am I gonna pay the electric bill? Or am I gonna buy groceries? You're every day making those type of critical decisions and it creates a serious mental toll on you that deactivates your ability for you to get ahead. You get caught up in this negative loop of just surviving doing what you have to do, you know, making miracles happen out of anything. And I was in that situation and then I wrecked my car and I wrecked my car and I didn't even have insurance because that's how poor I was. You know, back in the day you could like, you know, because you had to have a physical insurance card, you get your physical insurance card, let your policy lapse and you roll around like that. You call it riding dirty. I was riding dirty and I got into an accident. I rear-ended someone. The car was totaled. And, you know, I remember it, it was so bad because I remember I hit this family and this, this girl, she's like 16, she's like, do you even have insurance? And I was like, I'm like all I can say, I was sorry. Cause I was just like, damn, how did she know? How did she know? Did it have a, you know, I had that look all over my face that I was riding dirty. So the car I had was totaled, I'm homeless. And then I read an ad in the Atlanta Journal and I find this place that's called a boarding house. That's a whole set of stories. That is just so crazy what happened. So here I am, and I take my last bit of money, I get this place, and I'm not sleeping 
because I don't have my car. Since I lost my car, I couldn't sleep outside because I didn't have anything to sleep in. And I have a way to get around. I didn't have a way to get to the gym. And it was just, it was so overwhelming. It was really, really overwhelming. It was, it was crazy. And then I remember my first night in the boarding house. I'm in the bathroom, I'm taking a shower, and then there's these, there's these Muslims and there are these drug lords. They get into a, a fight and all of a sudden, bullets start coming through the window and I'm hitting up toward the shower and I'm crouched in the shower like, what the hell just happened? And this is why when you put yourself in the proximity of poverty, bad neighborhoods, you could do, be doing nothing and you could become a statistic. And I was just sitting there like, what has happened to me? Then I go through this process and this is where, remember what I told you about how my peer group thought I was an outsider? I was broke, I was homeless, I had no car, I had lost my job, and the people in the West End thought I was a police officer because I shaved. I would literally have people around the neighborhood walking, what's up, Mr. Officer? How you doing, Mr. Officer Jones? I was like, just simply because I shaved. Because the simple act of being clean shaven and having a certain level of grooming separated me from them. That was it. I was just, you know, many of them were better off than I was financially. And they were walking around thinking that I was a, an installed operative or some crazy stuff. And then this was a three year period from 97, 98, 99. In the 97, 98, I was just feeling sorry for myself. I mean, because it, it was such an overwhelming descent because I lost an apartment, I lost my car, I was just out here, just living. And then I had responsibilities, I had obligations, I had bills that were piling up. It was hell. And, you know, I know that many of you are about to, or some of you right now are right there. And I, I'm here to tell you, as bad as it gets, that is the here and now. It is not the future. It is not the future. You cannot let your present circumstances define what your future will be. I didn't understand that and I didn't know that at the time. So I was going out in the first two years, I was working all of these crappy jobs, but I kept my character, I kept my work ethic, because later off, these things will work, work really well for me in the future. And about 99, I started to straighten up and I began to understand what happened to me and I took off the stroud of victimhood and I began to accept responsibility for my situation and I began to make better decisions. And this is where I came across Earl Nightingale, Lead the Field. This is where I came across the power of your subconscious mind. And I met this girl, and this was funny, because even though I was a bum, I, I was a, you know, TLC, you, you, you a scrub, trying to holler out the side of your best friend's ride, I, that was me. I didn't have no money, I had no prospects, I had no future, I was just living. But I was able to meet some nice women and form some relationships during that time. And this girl who lived in the city apartments, like, it was these nice apartments that were downtown Atlanta. She took a liking to me. We started hanging out and she introduced me to meditation. That was a, a game changer. Meditation actually calmed me down and enabled me to be very introspective and to see what was going on and to feel and to understand the many things that were happening. So after that, I got a better job at VoiceStream, which is now T-Mobile. And I was working really hard, I was happy, I was inside, because you know, one of the things that happens is when you fall into these poverty traps, you know, what becomes a good job versus a bad job is dependent upon if it's inside and clean or you're outside hauling bricks or pouring hot tar on the roof. These are all the things I did. I did several, several of those jobs. So I was inside, I was, you know, my effective rate was like 15 bucks an hour. I was making a lot of money, I was doing well, I was starting to dig myself out the hole. Then one day, it's like, hey, I need to speak to you. I go into his office and I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm getting a promotion or something because I'm burning it up. It's like, we gotta let you go. 
And at this point, a lot of my narratives begin to crash. I'm doing a good job. I'm salesman of the month, you let me go. And it was a very valuable lesson for me to learn because I did not control my destiny because I was placed in there through an agency. So I didn't come through the front door, I came through the back door. And that's typically where the trash is removed. And I remember, because at the time I had been listening to Earl Nightingale, I had been listening to Tony Robbins, I had been reading The Power of Subconscious Mind. And at that moment, I made a decision. I wasn't a victim. I was like, I'm like no, I don't need two more weeks. I'll go home, I'll figure it out. And I went home, and this is where I concocted Scheme Incorporated because I knew the value of technology and I had a computer. I had figured out a way to get myself a computer and I got on that computer and I went to monster.com and I created five different resumes for five different jobs that I applied for and I got one because I knew that my problem wasn't a lack of work ethic, it was a lack of opportunity and then I created this plan and I wrote it down. I wrote a handwritten plan and then I, I created my own reference and it worked. It was the first time because this was the stuff that I got from Earl Nightingale, this is the stuff I got from Tony Robbins, and this is the stuff that I got from Power of Subconscious Mind. And I imprinted it on my mind that I was going to get a better job and I got my first really good job because it was like 1999. I was making $38,000 and some change plus commission. And it was one, of, you know, it was more money than I was making in the hospital working two jobs. So this actually removed me from the poverty situation. Because at that point, I became about solid middle class because $38,000 adjusted for inflation today would be close to 70. So I started off with a really good position, I got into a good crowd, I started a network, and this is when the, the upward descent began. And also, this is where my good work habits kept me in the game. So I understand you may be working a crappy job, you might be doing some bullshit, I understand that, but you gotta do it to your best of ability because you don't want to give yourself bad habits. You don't wanna do that. and. I, you know, and also because of the experience that happened to me at T-Mobile, I wasn't employee, employee, I wasn't a loyal employee anymore. I was a renegade. I was like, I'm gonna come to this company, I'm gonna get what I need, and then I'm gonna bounce because I'm never gonna be laid off again. So I was at Renegade eight months, I was at Panel System eight months, I was at Business Environments eight months, and I got what I needed, and then I bounced and I started forming my own economy, my own business. And I've not, I've, I've not had a job since business environments. I've never gone back to the employee side of the quadrant. And I'm here to tell you that, you know, it was really, really bad. And this is where I'm at today. You can do it. It's not going to be easy. I'm not going to, plat, you, know, pl you know, blow smoke up your buttons like, oh, it's going to, it's, it's not because you're gonna go through a personal transformation, you're gonna go through a physical transformation, and you're gonna go through a spiritual transformation because when you're poor, everything changes. And you know, unless you, you know, cause this is why, you know, I can live in this neighborhood and live the lifestyle I know and still recognize that there are people out there who are poor, who are suffering, cause I used to be one of those people. And those memories never go away. Never go away of shivering in a cold winter night in a room that didn't have any heat. Right now there are people who are renting apartments that don't have hot water, that don't have working appliances, that literally have roaches crawling all over the place. This is where people are living right now. And one of the things is, remember what I said, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what's happening to you when you're going through this descent because it's hitting you on a spiritual, mental, and often physical level, and you just adapt. You just start doing what you have to do to survive. So one of the things that you have to do is understand what is happening. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this video, to give you some clarity to what's happening to you in the traps. The first trap is you're gonna get comfortable living that lifestyle. 
This is one of the things I run, used to run into with many of the men I used to work with who were casuals or working day labor. There are people who become acclimated to the day labor lifestyle. They just, that's like, hey, I got 35 bucks today. I can get me some, some to drink. I can get me some to smoke. And that's all they live for. So one of the ways to avoid this trap is to have very lofty goals. And these goals will seem impossible at the time that you're where you are. But you gotta have them. Because once I started setting goals, once I began to understand who I was, where I was, and what was happening, because the, the thing is, this is so pernicious. It can happen to you overnight, and you can become a person that's always in crisis mode. Everything's a crisis. And that's, you don't even know how to operate unless there is a crisis because that becomes your de facto operating behavior. So you gotta pull yourself out of that and you got to start thinking, I am worthy. At one point during this thing, I got deeply, deeply depressed and I, I didn't feel like anyone loved me. I didn't feel like I'd even deserve love. I, I didn't feel none of that stuff. And then I started to remember that wherever I went, that people adopted me and liked it me over and over again. This was just a reoccurring theme in my life. Wherever I went, people just liked me. And I was like, okay, you're a valuable person. You, you have value. And I had to give myself, the, it had to be the internal cheerleader and give myself the pep talk to get myself out of the depressive funk, which and I wouldn't recommend it. You know, if you're really depressed, you may need to go see someone. This escaping depression isn't something that everyone can do and it isn't a matter of you being really strong or weak it's a matter of just how bad it is for you my depression wasn't clinical and i was able to work my way out of it but you know even then i did have some behaviors and stuff where i still sought therapy and that was really beneficial so if you need to go to therapy go to therapy and one of the things is you have to understand the game. You have to understand how things work because you were taught a set of assumptions and a, a narrative that can be falsely 100% false. But if you operate and move like it's real, it becomes real. And this is what happens to so many people who are literally trapped in poverty. You know, I've made this recommendation before, but go ahead and watch The Wonderful Whites of West Virginia. That will open up your eyes to generational white poverty, that cycle after cycle. Because see, what happens is this negative loop keeps replicating. And they just keep going in the circle. Drugs, jail, poverty, out of the way. It just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. What broke me out of it was getting laid off. But I had been doing some self-education, so I had knowledge of the situation. Because Earl Nightingale, because you know, when I was getting laid off, Earl Nightingale's voice was in my head and was like, you know what, you're gonna serve somebody. You're gonna, you're gonna do better. This, this is not going to be the end of you. And I went home and I did what I needed to do and I came up with a plan and I got the best job of the time for me. And I worked my way out of that situation. And literally, once I began to operate, and this is the thing, you, you have to be a person of action. If you're just kind of sitting around being depressed, that's the worst thing you can do. So literally, from the time I got laid off till I got the job at Renegrate was six weeks. It was literally six weeks. And it could have been faster if, um, if I had did a few, a few things a little differently. Because Renegrate, because I got a call from the, the president of Renegrate, it's like, hey, did you get your offer letter? And I was like, no. The next day I got a, a um, UPS overnight thing with my offer letter and I was just reading this. We'd like to offer you this job. Starting salary would be 38. That, you know, for me, that was such a pricely sum because I had never made that kind of money in my life. And then I, I actually, checked myself, I was reading off a lot of it, I was like, okay, I'm gonna accept this job, but I'm gonna make more money. I'm gonna do this job, I'm gonna learn what I need to learn, but I'm gonna be out after a certain period and I'm gonna make more money. Even though I was still in that, because 
Even before I accepted the job, I set the goal to get a better job to make more money. Because I had learned about these traps that keep you poor. There's a mindset trap, there's a money trap, there is an acceptance trap, and I immediately was like, instead of, you know, I, I had no illusions that I was gonna go work at rent crate and be there for 40 years. It was like, I'm gonna be there as long as I need to be there, I'm gonna get what I need, and I'm gonna go. And that's what happened. And then I got another, my next job, I made 60,000. $22,000 a year bump, $22,000 adjusted for income, that's six figures. Then I was there, I networked, I needed to, I learned what I needed to learn, I got things done, then I bounced. It was a plan. See, once I understood where I was and what was going on, I understood that I needed a plan. You need a plan. And you need to be active and you need to be working on your plan. And then I was there eight months and I bounced. Business environments, my first six-figure job ever in life. But I had built a big a book of business because the whole time I was active. Whenever I went home, I was listening to Earl Nightingale, I was listening to Tony Robbins. It, it was just, it was a plan. And then I was at business environments and I formed my own company and I began, I started my company, which I advise you guys to do while I still had a job. Well, I still had checks coming in. I did not go out here like, I'm gonna start a company, I'm gonna quit my nine to five and three. No, no, no. This was a plan. Because the ultimate plan was for me, and I didn't even know, see myself as a business owner, but I wanted to put myself in a position where I couldn't be laid off again. And then that ultimately was being a business owner. And that's where I ended up. From being homeless, to sleeping in my car, in the garage, the parking garage at Northside Hospital to wreck in my car, to sleeping in a room with no heat, no air. I went from all of that. See, you are more powerful than you know. And one of the things is due to your social economic class, you may not ever, have, not ever have anyone tell you how special you are. You may never have anyone in life tell you how powerful you are and what you're capable of. And this is where the programming of lower socioeconomic kids is really damning. You've got little kids out here, they've never been hugged, they've never had a birthday party, they've never been shown any love, their parents just had sex and had them and that was pretty much it. And they never had a chance because they didn't know what they didn't know. So hopefully this helped you and understand like right now it's crazy, I know that you know, per my last video, 13.13% unemployment, you're being lied to. It, it, you're just being lied to and you're being manipulated because they need your vote. That's the only reason you're being told us, they need your vote. They need you to vote for them based upon false narratives. So what I want you to do is to sit down and take a sheet of paper and write out what kind of life that you want. Because this is one of the things I did. I did this the night that I created Scheme Incorporated and I was like, what kind of life do I want? And I was like, I want to make money. I want to be somebody important. I want to be someone of note. And write down what kind of life that you want, even though your life could be on fire. I mean, right now you could be three, four months behind on your car payment. You could be on the verge of being evicted. This is the time that you create this critical action because Remember, your now is not your future. What's happening now is not your future. As someone who's been there, as someone who's been worse off than most of you, I mean, it was just really bad being poor because of all of the things that come into being poor and the negative mindsets and the negative loops and everything. And like I climbed out of it, you can too. You can climb out of it easier than I can because of the, the internet wasn't what it was. You know, the internet was around, but the internet wasn't what it is today. And literally, the internet can transform your life. And I knew the internet was powerful, very, very powerful. And that's why I had that computer.
And that was one of the reasons I was able, because you know, I had a computer. I didn't have to go to the library to do this. I was able to do this from my bedroom. So take heart and go below, get 30 days to 2,500, get the hustler's mindset, get those two courses. Don't just download them because they're free, but get them because they can help you change your life. And if you're in the position where you want to go to the next level, go ahead and get How to Make Money from Scratch. There will be a live webinar coming up very soon. There's already a ton of information there to help you navigate what's going on and for you to build a business to serve your community. Because I'm telling you, you can do it. You really can if you believe and start to learn what you don't know. Those are the two keys. First of all, you got to believe you can do it. Because when I came home and I concocted my plan, I believed it in my core that I can carry this out, and it worked. So go ahead and do that, and then check out this next video right here.